Today, we will be catching up with Greens MP, David Shoebridge, recently sworn in on 1st of July to a federal Senate seat after the Greens enjoyed an unprecedented result in the recent election. He joins us today from Sydney. David Shoebridge, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure, Suzanne. Always good to chat. Speaking of contracts and transparency, I'd like to move now onto your justice portfolio. First and foremost, something you as a justice and government transparency warrior of many years standing have been fighting for, and that's whatever the equivalent is of a federal ICAC. Now, I understand there's been things moving in that direction, which looks quite promising. Can you give us an update on that? Where are we at with the federal ICAC or Integrity Commission or whatever they may call it? Well, we'll call it a federal ICAC, just to make it simpler, but I'm sure it'll come out with a new acronym. But the... Um, <laughs> It'll be the challenge learning the new federal acronym, Federal Integrity Commission or something. Um, the uh, but I think there are there is there are really positive signs in that. The initial set of principles that Labor took to the election and were bringing to the what have been a series of roundtables that the Attorney General has had with crossbench members, including myself, on behalf of the Greens. Those initial principles were inadequate um, and, and they, they put a too high a threshold for the investigation. They put the threshold at serious um, uh, and systemic. The corruption would have to be serious and systemic before the investigation was, was able to be undertaken. They, they prevented any kind of review of third parties. It, was in, you know, it wasn't going to look at corporates trying to corrupt government, but simply government itself. Um, and there were serious concerns about the oversight. Now, there's been a, some good faith exchange with um, the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus. There's been some good faith ideas brought forward by the crossbench and by, oh, obviously I would say, good ideas by the Greens um, as to how we can strengthen the um, Federal Integrity Commission. And I think we've moved, we've moved away on each of those issues. We've moved a little bit on each of those issues. There's, I think, the, my hope is we'll, we'll, we know we'll get a draft bill in the first sitting week in September. And my hope is we'll see movement on the jurisdiction, a broader jurisdiction. Um, we've, we've seen Labor change its rhetoric publicly from serious and systemic to serious or systemic, which is at least one step forward in terms of the threshold, lowering the threshold. And there's been some useful discussions, but no commitment yet, about having proper independent oversight. That's a multi-partisan committee oversight in the ICAC and also having a key role in setting this budget. But, you know, you can imagine that there's a lot of work still to be done. And you could also imagine that there's a lot of interests within the Labor Party, just like there were within the Lib former Liberal um, government, to, to sort of defame the ICAC before it gets started. Because they've, they've seen how a genuinely independent corruption body can be a real check on the government of the day and can turn on its creator if its creator behaves badly. Now, what I would say to the incoming Labor government is, well, there's, there's two answers to that. One is you could defame the ICAC, or the other one is you could behave well. <laughs> and so what I'm hoping is we're going down the fully funded, fully independent ICAC and a well-behaving government. Um, it really shouldn't we'll... be that difficult, should it? Uh... Yeah. Um, and. and and um, so, so that, I, I, if I want to give a summary, it's good faith. It's been a series of good faith engagements with the attorney. I'm hopeful that we'll end this year with an ICAC that ticks most of the boxes and hopefully all of the boxes we need. So I, I don't think we're going to get whistleblower protection sorted, but I'm hoping we'll get a commitment to have those, those sorted by the time ICAC opens its doors next year. Now, the other piece of legislation I'm interested in that's going to the Senate in September is the restoration of the territory rights. A subset of that, of course, will be their ability then to legislate their own voluntary assisted dying legislation as has been done in all the states. I know that it passed the House of Rest Flying Colours and it has very strong community support. I also know there's a lot of vested interests who will fight against it when it does go to the Senate floor. Are you expecting the numbers to be tight on that one? What's your general reading of the room in relation to restoration of territory rights? Well, our reading of the numbers is they'll be very tight. And at the moment, we see some of those sort of right-wing religious parts of the Labor Party organising to try and get the numbers to knock this off. And the same in the coalition, although 
maybe the a better analysis of the coalition is there's a tiny number of moderates who are trying to um, to increase their numbers. So the question is whether or not the small group of moderates from the Libs and the Nats will be able to counterbalance the small group of um, sort of right wing religious votes that are coming from the Labor Party. And I don't think if I don't know anyone who has a final answer on where those numbers are going to come. And um, which brings us to one of the key problems with this legislation. I mean, the legislation is good. It's about restoring territory rights. It's about allowing people in the territories to have the same right to decide their future as people in the states have. Um, and, and of course we should do that. But because it's in the context of overturning a prohibition on the territories legislating for voluntary assisted dying laws, both the major parties have decided that this is a conscience vote. Um, now, th this, this is, um, I think, you know, it's a significant problem that they've both decided it's a conscience vote because it should be just a matter of principle. Do the territories, should the territories have the same right to legislate for their people and their future as states have? Well, I think the answer is yes, they're mature enough to do that now. Um, but instead, because it happened to mention something with a kind of moral tinge to it, both Labor and the coalition sort of rolled over and said, oh, they'll have it as a conscience vote. If it wasn't a conscience well, vote, we would already have the legislation pretty much through the parliament. And the good news is that the Greens 12 senators, who are going to be critical to getting this legislation through, well, we're voting on the basis of principle. It's not a conscience vote for the Greens. We think Territorians should have the same right, the ACT and the Northern Territory, to decide their future as people in the States have. Um, and we're voting for it um, as a party. And we don't see it through this false prism of a conscience vote. My last question to your justice portfolio is in relation to the long-standing lack of action on the Royal Commission into Black Deaths in Custody. Now, this has been a chief item that you've been following for many years. You've helped many families through some terrible situations and things don't seem to be improving a whole lot, David, when it comes to the recommendations of the Royal Commission being brought in. Now that we have such a diverse crossbench and we have Indigenous voice to Parliament on the board, how do you think that's going to go? Do you think there's a real feeling now that we're going to be able to get the Royal Commission recommendations finally implemented, or is it going to go down some other ticket to can down the road track yet again? Well, I mean, the, the, there is still institutional resistance to um, implementing those recommendations. I mean, I, I was part of setting up a cross-party committee at a state level that went through much of these, many of these issues about how we deal with families and deaths in custody, particularly First Nations deaths in custody. And, and we, we, we wrestled with that issue for more than 12 months. We had recommendations and submissions from across politics and different stakeholders. And we came up with a bunch of consensus recommendations on that committee at a state level to reduce the bail population, to reduce, to remove some offences off the books, you know, summary offences off, off the statute books that have been used to particularly to target First Nations peoples, uh, recommendations about justice reinvestment, you know, stuff that we could do, really practical things we could do. And we, we got, you know, we had buy-in from those recommendations from, you know, me as a Green, Labor MPs, uh, Liberal MPs, National MPs, even the One Nation MP in, um, signed on to those, those recommendations. And yet when it got to the decision makers in the New South Wales government, they just said no to most of them, all the ones which would upset the police in any way. And, um, and, and, and I think that, that's kind of institutional resistance. I'm still getting a sense that it's there at a federal level. I mean, some of the good news that we have federally is that my colleague Lydia Thorpe, a Green Senator, first powerful First Nations woman and Green Senator from Victoria, she is also extremely active in this space. It's one of the core things she's put on the um, on the negotiation list when she and Adam Bant are going to meet with the with the with the Labor government over the voice um, referendum. Because what Lydia will tell you, um, what Dorinda Cox, another First Nations senator for the Greens, will tell you, what all the families that I talk to tell you is. Okay, well, you know, voice, constitution, all that over there, that's fine. Let's, let's you know, maybe that's, that'll all do some good. But get my kids out of jail. Um, get my young, get the young men out of jail. 
Um, find us empowerment. Empower our communities to decide our future. Stop, stop taking so many of our young people and putting them in the criminal justice system. Stop taking our babies. And, and, and those kinds of practical reforms are the, are the, the things that are front, front and centre in my demands. I know they're front and centre in Lydia and Dorinda's demands. Um, and, but again, we're getting that kind of institutional resistance at a federal level. But just to finish off, I'd like to ask you about the digital rights part of your portfolio. Now, as far as I'm aware, that hasn't previously been a standalone portfolio, but I also know that digital rights and um, the egregious police powers and spying on um, citizens without a warrant has become normalised in this country. And I'm guessing that that's the framework that you'll be looking at. Tell us about that portfolio and what you hope to achieve. Well, we wanted to elevate this issue, so we created it as a standalone portfolio. Um, it was a Greens portfolio about five years ago. Scott Ludlam had a, a Green senator from WA, and he did terrific work in the space. Um, and, and I think elevated the, the idea of digital rights and um, in a, at a federal level. So we want, to, we want to, if you like, revisit some of that profiling of the work. And, and you're right, we are, we are dead concerned about the growth of surveillance technology and the use of surveillance technology, data harvesting, impingement on our digital identities by both government and private industry. And, and in fact, in many, in many ways, one of the big risks we see going forward is government deciding to contract out a lot of the impinging on our privacy to private industry in order to get around constraints that we might be able to impose or do exist on the government. So um, we're, we're focused on facial recognition. We are focused on the way in which we've seen many of the um, large social media players abuse their algorithms to drive people down extremist, to, to extremist platforms and extremist ideas and, and away from any kind of, you know, public common, which is grounded in facts. We think that's quite dangerous that th those conscious decisions for, for commercial reasons to, to make us make our social media choices more and more extremist. Um, but we're also concerned with the way in which we've got data pooling and data harvesting. And I'll give you just one example. If, if you as a, as a citizen of Australia want to get even the most meagre income support from the federal government, well, then you are required to give them huge amounts of data about yourself and including weekly updates on where you've been, who you've seen, what you've done. Um, um, that data then is open to gross exploitation by the federal government with almost no controls on it and also potentially able to be harvested by private corporations who do much of the surveillance of people um, within that system. Um, we would be focused on reducing that data harvesting. Stop policing the poor, of course, would be a core part of that. But uh, be ensuring that those protections apply across the board. And, and then and the last thing I'd say is we think that there's, I think there's a powerful case for there to be a, um, a far more um, powerful rights in relation to privacy. And in fact, putting in a tort of, 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 of breach of privacy and allowing people to have an actual remedy when their privacy is breached. If you have a few actions like that, that would send some shockwaves through um, people whose business models are designed to breach our privacy and, and would actually, I think, be a part of, not all of, but a part of the solution. David, it's been great to catch up with you. We very much appreciate your time. You're no doubt extremely busy. You're heading back to the first Senate sitting in September, is that correct? That'll be the second. We've had that last fortnight. and, and Sorry. That was, yep. yeah. So... Um, um, yeah, it'll be the second, but I think that's going to be an even busier um, fortnight for the Senate. We're going to see that first ICAC legislation. We're going to be digesting the climate bill. Um, and um, But, you know, I like being busy, Suzanne, so that's good. How's your family coping? Because Canberra can be very hard on the personal <laughs> life, I know. It's long hours, a lot of travel, and Flanners isn't helping. How's that all going for you? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm super lucky. I have my partner, Patricia, is extremely supportive of me and has always been supportive of me. Um, both my daughters, you know, are, are realistic about what politics does to their dad, you know, how it takes them away, how much time it sucks out of me. But I, I want to, you know, 
I'm, this needs to be sustainable for me and the family. So I've tried to put some boundaries in to protect family time and try to work out the way that I can, you know, most effectively and efficiently engage with Canberra and not be sucked into the bubble all the time and spend time back in Sydney. I also think that's good to be grounded here in Sydney um, rather than constantly sucked in the Canberra bubble. But, you know, it does put a stress on your family. But I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing this stress like so many workers experience this stress in our economy, people who fly in and fly out for two weeks on mine sites. You know, this, we should actually have a good hard look at the way in which work impacts on families. And as I said, the stress that federal politicians face, you know, and it's stress with the, with the you know, the, the move to camp, the constantly relocating back and forth from Canberra and, and home, it's the 24 seven access. That is a unique set of stress, but it's, but it's also the kind of stress that is increasingly being felt by workers across the um, uh, across the economy, and I think we should have a good hard look at how our um, our economy is prioritising work over all of those other important parts of our that we should value every bit as much family, leisure, time in nature. I'll take you on a bush walk, Suzanne. In short. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Suzanne. That was Federal Senator for the Greens, David Shoebridge from New South Wales. This is Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us.